Today, we have someone on the podcast that I have not seen in real life since maybe pre-pandemic. Maybe it's been a, a minute here. Um, it's someone that a lot of you out there probably know if you didn't know from Georgia now uh, from her casting in a heck of a show that went viral that that popped all over the place. Um, but Annie Jorgensen is who we have on the podcast today. And Annie, I really appreciate you making the time. How are you doing today? Of course. Thank you for having me. I'm so happy to be here. I'm good. It's sunny in New York, so who can complain? Yeah, sunny, but what temperature? Mm, maybe like 45, so a little oh, green. No. No. Yeah. It was like 50-something this morning in Atlanta, and uh, I'll take a hard pass on that. Yeah, oh, for sure. we'll get there soon. For sure. So I kind of want to dive back into, you know, you and I have some context, right, with uh, with photography, with modeling, what have you, uh, and then us both going to Georgia. But there's so much that I don't know about you, so I I'm very very happy to kind of kind of dive in. Can can you walk okay. me back to uh, to where you where you came from, Wisconsin, which I did not did not expect. Yeah, uh, by mannerisms, by accent, by communication, did not expect Wisconsin. But what well, I mean, how the heck you end up at Georgia? Yeah. So I grew up outside of Milwaukee in a town called Mequon and I was born and raised, like literally lived in the same house my whole life. Um, and I always wanted to go to a big school that had like fun football games. And it felt like my entire hometown went from our hometown to the university of Wisconsin. And I loved Wisconsin. My family had a lot of ties to the school, mm -hmm. but I was like, I need something new. And I also wanted something warmer. And so I toured a bunch of schools when I, when it came down to it. And luckily I got a really good ACT score. So I did have my options open. So I toured something like 17 or 18 schools. Um, and I fell in love with Georgia when I was there. It was just something that I, I like didn't know anything about Georgia. And I got there and the power G was the same as the Green Bay Packer G. So I was like, oh my God, like this is a sign <laughs> I'm supposed to be there. Um, and I went to school for broadcast journalism. Georgia has one of the best programs in the country. So I toured, um, they have like a, a TV studio in mm -hmm. the school. So I saw that on my first tour there and I was just like, honestly sold right away. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was really my catalyst to coming to Georgia. And then the minute I stepped foot on campus, I was like, oh, this place is home. Like this is where I feel most like myself for whatever reason. I, I loved Wisconsin. Obviously my family's there. I grew up with really great friends, but I never felt like it was home for me. And when I got to Georgia was the first time I really felt that way. And then fast forward four years, I graduated the same year I competed for Miss Georgia and won. So I spent the year following my graduation also in Georgia, traveling all around the state. I was in a different town probably like every 48 hours, like living out of my car basically, mm -hmm. uh, which was so much fun. And then at the end of that year, I was like, okay, I've lived in and around Atlanta for this year. I was like, I think I need something bigger to decide where I want to settle. And that's how I ended up here in New York. Right on. Now, I want to go back a little bit. You said you didn't, Wisconsin didn't feel like home. Is there any particular reason? Mostly, mostly because of the weather. It was just so cold <laughs> and I'm such a warm weather person that when winter starts in October and ends in like May sometimes, I was like, this is, this is not for me. <laughs> yeah. But then you went to New York. Yes. But the cold is different. And it's very, it's, it comes in December, January. And like, what are we in now? March, April. And now mm -hmm. it's like finally getting out. So I like, I like having a four season. Like I like having winter. I want to see snow once throughout the year, mm -hmm. but then summers, oh my God, summers in New York are arguably hotter or as hot as they are in Georgia. The, the humidity oh, wow. is disgusting. Wow. Have you been out to Houston before? No. The humidity there is disgusting year round. Same kind of thing. It uh, I have not been up in up in New York in the summer. Uh, that's interesting. Now, when you went to so you're you're in Wisconsin, right? And and you did did you go just just straight um, elementary, middle, high, same place? Did y'all kind of move around? Did you stay in the same city? No, we stayed in the same city in the same home my entire life. I think when I was born, we like lived in one house and then I was like one year old and we moved to the house that I grew up in. Um, but I stayed in the same school district my whole life. Um, public school, loved it. Uh, yeah. yeah, like nothing too crazy. So, I mean, with that public school journey and I went to public school as well, not a private guy, you know, very public running around, had fun. You know, I'm glad that I went there before Georgia. You'd probably maybe say the same there. Yeah. Um, but when did you get on the circuit of, of pageantry? Like, you mm -hmm. know, you, you were Miss Wisconsin's outstanding teen 2011. Like, was that the first time that you had competed? Did you compete younger? 
No. So the first time I competed, I was 13 years old and it's actually a very funny story. So I grew up and like every year I watched Miss America and Miss USA, like many young girls do. Mm -hmm. And it's just kind of like, it was an activity that we would sit down as a family. My mom and I would watch it and talk about the pretty dresses. So I always knew it was a thing, but when I was growing up, I thought it was celebrities that would compete. And I didn't realize it was normal women who did. So fast forward, maybe five, 10 years. And I got a postcard in the mail and I was 12 years old and it invited me to come to this open call to audition, to enter into a pageant. So I like came with this postcard to my mom and I was like, mama, like I'm ready for this. Meanwhile, in whatever crazy element of my head, I really believed I was destined to be on Disney channel. Like I thought that was my calling. So within, when I got this postcard, I was like, oh my God, this is it this is my chance. There's going to be Disney channel scouts in the audience. Like I'm going to be discovered if I go and do this. But I was also really shy. Like I was outgoing and conversational in the people that I knew, but if I was in an uncomfortable or a new place, I very, very much kept to myself. Very rarely did I do anything by myself. So this was the first time I was asking my mom to do something only for me and by myself. Um, but when I came to her at 12, she was like, absolutely not. That's ridiculous. Uh, she thought pat she thought pageants were like the toddlers and tiaras type trope, and they mm. were only glam and only about looks. She was like, definitely not. And so she was like, if you still want to do it a year from now, we'll reconsider. So in that year, I like kept pushing it, kept pushing it, kept pushing it because I knew that it was more than just looks. I knew that it involved academics. I knew that it involved community service and a talent. Um, and I also knew at 12 that I was going to go out of state for college. Like for whatever reason, I just knew it in my soul. And so to know that the prize money was scholarship money, I was like, that would help me in my quest to going out of state. So all these things added up. So I like truly went on a campaign tour 12, 12 to 13, fast forward a year. And my mom came around. And so I competed for the first time that summer and fell in love with it. I really came into my own. I fell in love with public speaking and with interviewing and talking to strangers, which mm -hmm. helped me decide my future career, what I thought was going to be my future career mm -hmm. in journalism, specifically broadcast. And so my mom saw this evolution literally in a weekend. And so she dove head first in with me. And 10 years later, I was competing at Miss America. Sheesh. Okay. So was 2011 the first, was that like the first year that you competed? No. So I competed for the first time, I think it was 2008 and it was in an organization called National American Miss. And so I competed in NAM for two years mm -hmm. And then I met somebody along the way and she was like, oh, I know you dance. You should look into the outstanding teen program. So I did. And I actually, when I competed for the first time at Wisconsin's outstanding teen, I had mono. And so I had never done my talent, which was two minutes long the whole way through because I didn't have the energy to do it. And so the first time I did it was on stage, like from, from start to finish was on stage. My mom was literally like in tears in the, in the crowd thinking I wasn't good. Like I was going to pass out on stage. Um, and my mom tells a story better than I do, but as I was getting ready to compete, she was doing my hair and makeup and I was actually dead asleep as she was doing it. And she was like, I hope this girl just like wakes up to compete. And so I don't know how I got away with winning, but at the end of it all, I won. And that was like my first feeling when this is actually an interesting little sidebar and then I'll, we'll move on to the next thing. Um, but when I was Miss Wisconsin's outstanding teen, the woman who was Miss Wisconsin, uh, the teen and the Miss do a lot of appearances together throughout the year. You travel together. And this was when Miss America was in December or in January. So we had a when good six months together. Huh? When is it now? It used to be in January. It used to be in January. And then for a really long time, it was in September. And then recently it's back to like December winter time. Um, but so we had six, I had six months with the Miss Wisconsin. Her name was Laura Kepler. She was incredible. We got really close as families. And then come Miss America, she actually won. And so at me, for me, I was 15, 16 years old. And I saw what in my mind was a normal girl who was very relatable. I looked to her as a friend, as a mentor to see her work really hard and have that hard work pay off and her become Miss America is when it dawned on me, I was like, it doesn't matter where you're from. It matters who you are. It matters the work that you do, but you can actually accomplish the goals that you set for yourself. And that just seeing that happen for her really, I think changed the trajectory of my life. So I went on to become Miss High School America, my senior year of high school. I traveled the country and internationally speaking on anti-bullying that led me to exploring more schools and more schools out, out of state. I got a really amazing scholarship to go to Georgia, 
couldn't say no. Um, and the journalism program was right where I wanted to be. So it was like every, I truly believe everything happens for a reason. Okay. So dang, you got in, mom said, no, you were like, yeah. no mom, we're doing this thing. A year later, you're competing a few years, like two years later, you're miss high school, mm-hmm. right? You're miss high school America. And then yep. you're like, Hey, we're off. We're off to the races. We're going to find a school that we're going to, we're going to find uh, a place where it's going to be a new home. And then did you know going into Georgia that you wanted to still compete on the on the next circuit? Uh, Miss America was always the goal for me. And so when I went to school my freshman year, I was just coming off of my year as Miss High School America. And mm-hmm. I had traveled like crazy while being a full-time student and being on my dance time, which was a year, my dance team, which was a year round sport. Mm-hmm. And so I was exhausted. So I went to school and I was like, I'm going to have fun. I want to go to the tailgates. I want to join a sorority. I want to don't do this this is not an endorsement. I wanted an underage drink. Like I was ready to party. I was ready to go and have fun. And so I did that my freshman year. And then around winter time, um, I learned that there was something on campus called Miss University of Georgia, which fed in to the Miss America system. And I was like, this is a sign. I am not ready yet, but I know that I want this to be my goal. And so then I competed for Miss UGA my sophomore year, one. And then that was my first introduction to the Georgia pageant system, which eventually led me to Miss America. Word. So the, um, I mean, the university of Georgia, Miss, Miss university of Georgia, when you got that title first, is that very similar to other pageant circuits where you're doing appearances and jumping in at, at games and going to specific events and like going to stuff at Tate and, and that kind of thing. Oh yeah. Yeah. You're basically a representative of the school. I looked at it as a liaison between the students, the student government association, and then the administration. So I worked with president Jerry Moorhead a lot. I worked with Mm -hmm. a lot of the deans. I worked with the SGA a lot. Um, and then like other fun events that were happening around campus. Um, and something that a lot of people don't realize about pageantry, specifically the Miss America organization is you have to have a platform. I think they call it something else now, like a social impact initiative or something like that. Mm -hmm. Basically what that is, is it's a nonprofit organization or a societal issue that you pledge to yourself to say, okay, when I win or if I win, I'm going to spend my year of service committing myself to this advocacy. And so I actually created my own program, which evolved into the I Got This program where I taught young girls where self-confidence comes from. So when I was Miss High School America, I was teaching bullying. And that's when I really realized going in and out of all of these schools, I was like, yes, bullying is happening and it's happening everywhere. But it clicked for me. I was like, okay, if people just are confident in who they are, they don't have to bully other people. And if they are bullied, they can either stand up for themselves or they can let it roll off their backs. So I really shifted my messaging when I was a teenager to talking about who you are, what makes you special and why confidence is so important to have. And that really continued all through college. And so when I started competing for the Miss Georgia system, I dove into, I got this immediately. I actually hosted um, for a fifth grade class. I hosted this workshop, which was a five-week program. And I was doing this while I was in school. So it was a five-week program. I worked with a group of, I think it was around like 10 fifth graders and they were all fifth grade girls. And I had them do a survey at the beginning of our time together and a survey at the end, the same survey. Mm -hmm. And it came down to the end of it. And they all reported something like, 60 to 80% an improvement in their confidence. And so I saw these re- like true tangible results and I thought, oh my God, this is, this is real and this is working. And so then I took that information in the program that I taught, created a workbook and sold it to the Girl Scouts of America. And so now there's a confidence patch that Girl Scouts all throughout the country can earn. That is wild. how do you come up with the name? I got this. Uh, my mom was a big helper. My mom and my aunt who lives in Georgia were just like talking and brainstorming mm-hmm. about my platform. I knew what the platform was, but we all wanted a catchy title for it. Mm-hmm. And my mom was upstairs or something and taking dishes down to the, the like where the kitchen was. And she was carrying it all. And someone was like, oh, do you need help? And she's like, no, I got this. And we were like, oh, that's it. <laughs> and so that's kind of where it came from. That's wild. How, how did you, um? so you came up with the name, you implemented it on a on a on a very small level, and then we're like, hold on, if this can change fifth graders to this level, what can happen with with adults that have more development of the prefrontal cortex? What can happen with people that are further along in their development journey getting this training then? Um, yeah. But how did you get plugged in with with Girl Scouts of America? Did you already have an end from the circuit, or 
No, blood, sweat, and tears. Uh, I I emailed and and I emailed and I emailed and I emailed and I called and I emailed and I showed up and I went everywhere. And finally I was connected with the right person and it just went from there. But it was, when I say it took me like two years to see it through, it was truly a labor of love. Yeah. About how many outbounds do you think you did? Like hundreds? No, not hundreds. I mean, they're not like that many people Mm because, and many people don't know this, but Girl Scouts actually founded and began in Georgia. And so the headquarters of Girl Scouts nationally is in Savannah. And so I kind of have tailored my approach to like more Georgia specific Mm -hmm. outreach. So, I mean, I started with like troop leaders who would give me the contact of their representant. So it was probably like 30 to 50, but talk about follow-ups, then we're up in the hundreds. Uh, oh like, my goodness. Me again. <laughs> Did you forget about me? I'm back. <laughs> I don't want to bother you, but <laughs> here we are the but 14th time. Right. <laughs> yeah. And and so what what year about that was that? Like when you got connected? I really with- started I started that outreach in 2016 and then mm-hmm. it came to fruition in 2018, right about the time that I was competing for Miss Georgia in the year that I won. Okay. And and so when you won, what is I mean, the obligations obviously if you were, you know, Miss High School um america like are the obligations different are they more are they less are they just sit in in bigger rooms with people that have more money to donate like what what does that look like it's definitely more so it varies from state to state within the miss america organization and it's changed even since the time that i have competed well like i'll touch on that in just a second um so when i won you were required whoever wins is required to either take a year off of school or work to be miss georgia full-time so it truly a full-time role Mm -hmm. i would call it a nine to five but it was more like a seven to midnight seven days a week and it would Mm -hmm. just depend on your schedule of what was happening um there is a team of people or there was at the beginning of my year Um, at the state level that would help you find appearances and all of the appearances that I did were paid. Um, So that was how I made an income for the year. And so there was a team of people initially and a business manager that Miss Georgia had, you know, like tent pole moments throughout the year. Like Mm -hmm. she always did the Savannah St. Patrick's Day Parade. She always did the Rattlesnake Festival. She always did like certain things throughout Mm -hmm. the year that were always booked, but then to supplement, um, I worked with the business manager really closely. However, uh, I competed for Miss America in September, and then the week after I got back, this was the year, if you are really quizzing your pageant knowledge, this was the year that Miss America took swimsuit away, and there was all this upheaval from different states of offering their support and, you know, speaking out against that decision. And so the state of Georgia, not me necessarily, but um, the board is what they're called, the people who are in charge. They were speaking out in the Washington Post and in the New York Times and anybody that would listen to them, they were speaking out against this decision. And it wasn't about taking away swimsuit. It was just about what Miss America stands for and the messaging of how and why that area of competition was being taken away. So come to Miss America in September and I competed. I did not make top 15, got home. And then a week later, the entire Miss Georgia board was fired by the Miss America organization. I didn't know if that meant that I was also fired, but now what I thought was a job where I had a team of people helping me all fell on myself. And so I like spraying right into action. And I at least had things in the works that Mm -hmm. I was going for, but it really adjusted my mindset where I wasn't just a representative. I wasn't the face of an organization anymore. Now I was a business person first. I was like, okay, if I'm not getting income from their help, how am I going to survive this year? And so it was truly a nose to the grind. My mom actually ended up moving to Georgia. We lived with her sister, my aunt for the year. Um, And I was supposed to have uh, a Miss Georgia apartment. And that obviously didn't happen. Uh, but my mom moved to Georgia to be my quote unquote business manager. And so she was so incredibly helpful because there were just too many emails to field in a day while I was also doing the job. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was, I mean, I like to say like we completely innovated and revamped what it is to be Miss Georgia. What it used to be is, you know, you go to school, school visits and that's really great. And you go to parades and there's a lot of parades throughout the year. I don't necessarily love parades. I get that you like wave show face 4th of July. I'm all in the Savannah Mm -hmm. parade um, for St. Patrick's day was actually really fun. 
But I wanted to spend my year actually making a difference and also thinking, okay, if I am done with this year and I'm entering into the workforce, what can I do this year to set me up to get a job once I'm done? So I was thinking, how can I use my skills within my journalism degree and my journalism expertise to set me up for some kind of job or to have an employer that most likely doesn't understand pageants appreciate the work that I did for the past year. And so I did a lot of speaking. I spoke in schools, Girl Scout troops, organizations, nonprofits, businesses, like you name it. I was like, oh my God, I'm here. Hello. Listen to me. Um, So I was there all the time. And then I also started a video series called Sweet Georgia Finds, where I um, would take like a really small camera and film attractions, hotels, things that were unique to Georgia, and then post them online. And so all of these things led me to my career post Miss Georgia. So this was a very long winded way to say that there is a lot bigger of an expectation when you are a full time title holder. Not every state is that way. Some states are volunteer based only. Mm -hmm. Um, But for at least the state of Georgia, it was that way. But there was so much turmoil behind the scenes within my year as Miss Georgia that I truly became way more tough. And like, I became a businesswoman. And I always said that year that, you know, when people say it's not personal, it's just business. I was like, I've never understood that more. Wow. That's a, that's a lot to be going through right after graduation. Yeah. Oh my God. I was like 22 years old and I was like, well, people were tr- treating me like really horribly. And I was like, they, I, in my mind, I was a kid and that was my shock of being like, no, I'm an adult now. Like, welcome to the real world. Yeah. Uh, do you think that, that the, the Georgia, so the Georgia support that you had inside, um, Miss Georgia under the Miss America circuit, um, do you think that, that them speaking out so heavily had anything to do with your placement at the national? I don't know if it's my ego, but I say yes. Who knows? Who who really knows? Um, but I will say in my interview for Miss America that I've literally dreamed about my entire life, they asked me about my talent being ballet on point and how I studied abroad. My talent was not a dance on point and I did not study abroad. So I don't know if they got confused, but it was just really disorganized. We actually didn't know until the end of the week what the percentages of the breakdown of the scoring were. So we didn't even know how we were being scored until it was over. That seems a little interesting. Were, would, was Georgia the only state or does, did everyone not know? Nobody knew. Um, but Georgia and I think it was four or five other states, their boards were completely fired. And then there was like this whole big legal battle where I want, it's like so nuanced. It, it'll take me 10 yeah. years to explain, but basically like there was an old Miss Georgia board, a new one. I was stuck in the middle. And because of this lawsuit, there was a cease and desist on both ways. So I couldn't communicate with either team. And so that's really what made me isolated on this island to do this job completely by myself. Yeah. What do you think the biggest lesson that you learned was though, when you had to kind of, Hey, and, and also shout out to mom. I hope yeah. she hears this. Shout out to mom. She seems like every single turn where a parent could say, Ah uh, no, no, babe, you got it on your own. Or maybe you shouldn't do that. That's too big of an opportunity. She stepped in and stepped up and supported you. Yeah, every sweet mama Jill. Time. She is a superhero. She is my partner in crime. I'm literally so grateful to her. And I'm also grateful to my dad too, because they basically took a year off of their marriage while my mom moved to Georgia to live with me and to be my business manager. So, I mean, I'm really blessed to come from a family that is that supportive and also had the means where my mom mm-hmm. could do that, you know, and take a year off of any work that she was doing. Yeah, no, that's, I mean, that's, that's a beautiful thing. That's a beautiful yeah. thing that not only some would, some people would never do for someone that they yeah. birthed or, or someone else that they know. And and then number two, that the means were there where that was possible, where, you know, the family didn't go up under. So yeah. I mean, that's, that's definitely a, a, a beautiful, beautiful, uh, thing there you know that's yeah. and it made us really close too which was sweet is like I look back on that year and it was like so precious that I got to spend that year with my mom and also that year with my aunt and her family and so it was like we became incredibly close it was the three of us we were like the trio we all had our skills that we would rely on each other we were truly like a well-oiled machine by the end of it all um so yeah I really do look back on that part of that year with a lot of fondness yeah no that sounds that sounds awesome. So, I mean, once you got out of, so you finished that year, right? You're, you're not reigning, uh, reigning champion out here anymore <laughs> on, on the, on the uh, Miss Georgia side. And so then you, you end up going to New York. Is this when you jumped into small girls PR? 
Yeah. So there was a little bit of time between. So when I finished my years, Miss Georgia in June of 2019, I didn't have time to job search before. And so I really dove into my job search. And so for the summer, I was applying to all different jobs. And honestly, I wasn't sure if I was going to move to Washington, D.C. or New York. I had realized at that point that I didn't want to do broadcast. I didn't want to start in a local work market and work my way up. I wanted something bigger. I loved digital media and I loved women's media. So I was trying to find the perfect balance of that career opportunity for me. I very quickly nixed Washington, D.C. I didn't want to work in politics. That was just like not the scene. And so I really dove in to New York and I was applying to magazines. I, as a, I like applied to the NBC page program and made it through a few rounds of interviews. Oh, my God, that was crazy. Um, and then just applied to any anybody and anywhere. And then I would say about August, I literally had not heard back from any application and I had a running list and I applied to like something like 60 jobs. And I like literally hadn't heard back from anybody, even just saying no. Um, And so in August, one of my friends, Emily, she was actually Miss Virginia with me. So we competed at Miss America together. She posted on her Instagram story and she was, it was her and her friend, Mary. And she was like, who wants to be our third? We're moving to New York in October. I was like, I do sign me up. I don't care what it takes. I'll be there. And so then all of a sudden it became the trio of us. And then um, we signed a lease. And so I was like, great, I will figure it out when I get there. But now at least I have a New York address I can put on my applications, which did help. I actually did get responses once I was able to change that. Um, But yeah, so I moved in and moved cross country midway through the cross country. And I got my job offer at small girls PR literally the day before I moved into my apartment. So it was truly divine timing. That's why I always come back to like, everything happens for a reason. There is a timeline. You just have to trust the process. Yeah. And, and so you're over there like what, I mean, why them? Like, I'm sure if you're getting responses from other places with your, I mean, with everything that is, that has happened up to that point with you holding multiple titles, having a solid GPA, being very involved on campus, like you probably could, could have your pick of, of places to go, but like why small girls PR? That's really nice of you to say. I did not have my pick, but small girls was what I would have picked had I had 10 options. So I was going through at the time I got my offer, maybe like three other companies going through interviews for them. Um, small girls was just furthest along and it wasn't influencer marketing. And it was, that was the only position I was applying for that was on the influencer side, like working with brands to develop social media strategy. And that's what I determined what I wanted to do or what I thought I wanted to do having no experience. And so I really jumped on it right away. Jumped on it right away. Did you find that you didn't want to do influencer marketing after you got into it? No, I loved it. This is still what I do now. Okay. Okay. So you were over there, but I mean, where is the where's the timeline? So you're at you're at Small Girls. You are you are working there and yep. and seemingly from the outside, loving it, loving New York, having a ball. But then something gets released that uh, you're on this new show coming out. Yeah. How did that all come about? It's kind of a wild story. It comes back to Instagram. Um, and this is actually a very funny story that you'll enjoy. So I started working for Small Girls November of 2019. Worked okay. there for two and a half years. Mm-hmm. And 2021 was my year of yes. It was my New Year's resolution to say yes to as much as I could, unless I had a really good reason to not. And so I was saying yes to all different things, like going to dinner with my friends on whatever, you know, like doing just saying yes, like kind of within reason, but like having fun with it. Mm -hmm. Um, And so one day I was just like scrolling through my Instagram DMs and I got a message request from a casting director. So I looked at the message and she was like, Hey, we saw this video. And it was, it was actually the video of my Miss America talent. And she was like, we're casting for this dating show. It's dance based. We think you would be perfect for it. Do you have like 15 minutes for a conversation? And I was like, this sounds like a scam. And so I like Googled her, looked her up on LinkedIn, looked up the company, everything checked out. So I was like, okay, like, yeah, what's 15 minutes? What's a phone call? Like, what are they going to do through the phone if it is a scam? And so I took the phone call and it was very legit. And then um, they kind of described the show a little bit to me. Basically, imagine love is blind, but instead of being not seeing each other, you just don't talk, you meet by dance. And so it's like the craziest premise for a show. Um, And so they were like, okay, this is basically it tell me about your dance history. Tell me about your dating history. Tell me about your family, like very like surface level Mm -hmm. questions moved on to the next round of interviews, which was a video interview. And 
this was in the middle, I wouldn't say like peak pandemic, but it was still pandemic. So I was dressed from the waist up, but then I was in like Nike shorts underneath. And so then at one point I like stood up to move my laptop and he was like, Oh, do you have like pants you can put on that match the top? And I was like, I mean, yeah, why? And he was like, cause we'll need you to like stand up at the end of this. And we're going to film it to show the people like, we just want you to be in a full outfit. And I was like, great. Okay, fine. So I like turned my camera off, put, put jeans on. And then at the end of my interview, they're like, great. Can you just like dance around a little bit? But I was in my room and I was in New York. So my room in New York is like literally like 10 by 11. So I moved out into the living room. My roommate was making dinner and I was like, Kelly, just like be quiet for a second. And they're like, yeah, we're just going to play some waltz music and just dance around. And so then they literally played music on their phone, which you couldn't hear. So I was just like waltzing around my living room and I hang up and Kelly was like, Kelly's my roommate. She was like, you can absolutely not do this show. This is ridiculous. <laughs> and so I just like kept saying, yes, I kept going through the phases of interview. And then a few months later, I, and I had gone through like 10 more rounds of interviews at this point. Ten and so then for this um, show? 10, 10. And then they called me in like mid to late June. And they were like, so this show's not happening anymore, but we like you enough to consider for this other show that we're casting. It's think the bachelor. It's like the bachelor, but better. And I was like, what does that mean? Um, and they're like, basically, we just have to start over. So then I literally went back to like a phone interview number one, video interview number two to go through the motions again. Um, they flew me out to New York, or they, sorry, they flew me out to LA for my final casting where they put you in a room and like all these cameras and ask you all the questions you've answered a thousand times at that at that point. But they basically like see how you are on camera. Mm -hmm. um, and that's when they had it down to... I would say like 40. I had no idea how many people were there. Mm -hmm. So then they flew me out to LA. I had a psych review to make sure that I was mentally sane Maybe. or insane enough to be on the show. And then I had an STD screening past that, you know, like all of the things that go into mm -hmm. a reality TV show production. And then I didn't hear anything for like six, not, not six weeks, but probably like three to four weeks. And I was like, all right, like this has been a fun ride. Like what a fun experience to talk about. And then I got a call on a Tuesday and the casting manager was like, so excited. Like you made the show. And I was like, oh my God, like, cool. Like this is so great. Uh, what does this mean? And he was like, well, you leave Sunday. And I was wow. like, what? And he was like, yep. So you leave Sunday and it will go to like mid to late October. So just like, let your employer know. And I was like, I'm sorry, what? Luckily I had been talking to my job all along the way. And I was like, look like this might happen. It probably won't, but like, just want you to be aware of it if it does come. Mm -hmm. And so they were anticipating this. And so my job gave me a leave of absence to go on the show. Um, and it was great because that was one thing that I was really concerned about. I was like, okay, what if I go and like get eliminated night one, and then I have to come back three days later to find a job. Like that's crazy. Um, and so they let me have this leave of absence and, I ended up staying at the show the whole time. I was there through late October of 2021 is when we filmed and I had the time of my life. So I'm sure you have questions about the show, but that's really how the show found me and how I ended up there. Yeah. So you get on the show and and when you, so this is a Tuesday and you're leaving out on Sunday, like excited from one to 10, where are you at? Oh, like 20. I was thrilled. And all summer I'd been like picking out clothes and reaching out to brands that I'd worked mm -hmm. with in the past being like, and again, I thought it was the bachelor. So I was reaching out to like dress stores of being like, I need gowns and I need like 15 of them. Um, so I was like doing my work <laughs> behind the scenes and all along the way, I was like, this might not need it be needed, but like, I'd rather be prepared. So more or less I was prepared. Mm -hmm. Um, I just had to like put everything in a suitcase and send me on my way. Um, yeah, but like, it was such a fast turnaround and, but it was very exciting. And then I got, well, let me, let me stop there. I'm sure you have questions. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm just curious. So, I mean, you've done tons of public speaking, right? You've been in the public eye many times. Like, was it being a part of a new experience that excited you most that got you that 20 out of 10? Or was it, Hey, this is potentially someone that I could legitimately fall in love with? Or was it, Hey, I'm about to be around a ton of people and my network's about to grow even larger. Like, what were you legitimately excited about? Because 
I know that people have different motives for doing this kind of thing for sure. Yeah. I think my number one reason for doing it was curiosity more than anything. Like I grew up, you know, Laura Kepler, who I mentioned before, who became Miss America, married Mm -hmm. the man that created The Bachelor. And so she, I was like Mm -hmm. hearing things from her. So I was always curious about how, you know, how real are reality shows? Mm -hmm. Like where, how does it work? How do they film? How do they get everything? So I was so curious. And especially with my journalism, you know, video production background too. I was like, how does this all come together? Uh, And so I was very intrigued. I knew, and I hoped that this would grow my, uh, you know, my notoriety online, my following online. Mm -hmm. I would be lying to you if I said that wasn't a part of my goal too. So that was a part of it. And then when it came down to it, I was like, okay. And I don't know who the guy is, but like, I've been single for at that point, like three and a half, maybe four years. I can't remember exactly, but I've been single for long enough. And I had been dating in New York and it like was not going well. And I was like, I mean, I've tried everything else. Like, why don't I just like try a TV show and maybe it will work. Um, but I forgot to mention this before, uh, but when we were going through the casting process, they called the show Love for Real. And so I thought the show that I was cast on was called Love for Real. All the contracts I signed all had Love for Real all over it. Um, and I thought it was one bachelor come to the show. It was the second or third day of filming. Come to find out that it's not Love for Real. It's actually Joe Millionaire, for Richard Poor. Um, and then there's not one bachelor. There are two. And then for those listening who haven't, looked at the show haven't seen the show don't know what it is basically the twist of it all because every show needs some kind of like twist right so this show both of the leads were blue collar ceos one was a farmer one was a construction worker but one was worth 10 million dollars and one wasn't and so when we found out the show was joe millionaire the host told us this information and then basically the show was like are they there for money or do they only care about money or love you know um which all of the women there were like, wait, what? Like, we just like are here for a relationship. <laughs> like, I don't care about money. Um, so it was kind of like a funny thing that all the producers like kept having to ask us about, okay, like, you know, I, you know, questions that drive us back to that money question. Yeah. As if everyone watching this, since they know what the show's title is and they know what the premise is coming into the show, but y'all didn't they're like, well, we got to yeah. cover our butts now. Yeah. And I think that was the point. Right. And so if they told us it was Joe Millionaire before we left, the show hadn't been announced to the public yet. So they had to keep that under, you know, really, really tight wraps. And then if we knew the twist, we could I don't don't know how you would plan ahead Mm -hmm. for it. But like we couldn't know any of the other contestants. There was one girl on the show who actually knew one of the leads. And so she was eliminated within like the first five minutes of the show um, because she knew he was the wealthy one. And so like Mm -hmm. that takes the twist out of it all. Um, So yeah, it was like the drama, right? Yeah. Okay. So you get there now was filming. Did your excitement stay up? Like stay all the way up once you were there? Yeah. I like when I say I had the time of my life filming that show, I loved it. A lot of girls did not have as good of of an experience that I did. Mm -hmm. Um, Well, so we start and you land. And so the production crew picks you up from the airport and takes you in the car. And then because we were still in the pandemic, we ha- all had to quarantine for like, I think it was like 10 days or two weeks or something. And so for the first seven days, we were all in like, again, I don't know anybody else there. We were all in our hotel rooms individually and like literally not allowed to leave our hotel room. I didn't have a room key, so I couldn't get in and out. So the third day of quarantine, I called the producer and I was like, um, I have to go outside. Can someone take me on a walk? And so then I got like my daily 10 minute walk in. But for those 10 days, the only like human interaction I had mm-hmm. was a producer bringing me my meal three times a day. And then I had my phone and I had my laptop for the first probably week of it. So I was doing like in hotel room workouts and I was watching Netflix and I was like doing other things to fill my time. But then a handful of days before filming started, they wanted us to like really think about ourselves, think about being in the moment, think about what we're looking for. Mm -hmm. And so they took our, all of our access to the outside world away. And so I didn't have a phone, didn't have a laptop. And then I didn't see my phone or laptop from Labor Day weekend all the way through almost the end of October. And when I tell you it was the best time of my life, I have never slept better. I didn't have any responsibilities. Like literally if I wanted orange juice, I would tell a producer I wanted orange juice. And then the next day it would be in the refrigerator. So it was just like 
I was living just not real life, but it was so much fun. And I got really close with the girls. We weren't obviously allowed to watch TV or anything like that, but something I wasn't expecting was a few things. Um, sorry, I'm on this like big tangent, but this no, is actually- go. That, that's what this is for. It's not for <laughs> me to be talking about it. I didn't live it. <laughs> Um, and so it was really interesting that some of the rules they had. So I knew like no phones, no nothing. I brought a journal so I could, you know, keep a one like decompress, but also like keep a memory of what was mm-hmm. going on. So the first day a producer come came to me when I was journaling and they were like, I'm so sorry, but you can't do that. They had this like private room with a camera that was basically like a verbal journal. She was like, if you want to like think out loud, just like go in there and talk to yourself. And I was like, I see what you're doing here. Um, So they took my journal away. We also weren't allowed to listen to music because we wore mics literally 24 seven. And so if songs were picked up, the licensing rights, Fox didn't have the rights to air that. Exactly. It's super way too much money. (laughs) Way Way too too much money. So we were like bribed. To, to songs, we would be going from point A to point B in the shuttle. And they'd be like, okay, if you guys talk really good for like 15 minutes, we'll play you two songs. And so we would like thrive for this music. There was one point late, late, late in filming. All I wanted to do was listen to music that I literally sat in the corner and like sang to myself until I forgot words. Um, that was crazy. And then the last crazy rule they had was we were never allowed to know what time it was. And so all of the clocks in the house were either off or not right And so we truly like had to live in the moment and never were questioning like, okay, how long until something else? It was just, we let life happen. And it was the the craziest, weirdest, most fun thing I've ever done. Yeah. It sounds like two different scenarios uh, where people also don't know what's next have to be present and time doesn't exist. And one is jail and prison, right? And the other is military selection, right? Like same thing. Phones are gone. No access to the outside world can't know anything. You have a number, not a name, Like you're literally <laughs> right there. That is yeah. wild. So how long did filming go on for? What was that like? Um, I think it was like seven, eight, nine weeks. I can't really remember. Nine but weeks. Like, yeah. Less than 10. Okay. And I've literally saw the, I saw the, the premiere episode where yeah. we, you, y'all did the intros um, and I didn't see any other episodes. Obviously I saw what happened at the end of the show. Um, yep. How were you feeling throughout all that? Okay. So I had an interesting experience because I went in and I was very Mm open-minded and I was like, look, if I meet somebody that I click with, great. I'm going to see where this goes. But on most of the dates I was going on in New York, I knew within the first five minutes, I was like, this guy's not for me. So I'm like, what are the chances that this one man that a group of random people chose and I click, I was like, most likely it's not going to work. So I get there and Steven is the farmer. He comes out first and he's like, I'm Steven. Welcome. Like I'm here to date you. And then Kurt came out second. And then Kurt was the construction worker. He has a man bun. He's a little bit older. Um, And he's like, I'm Kurt. I'm also here to date you guys. And we're like, what? Um, And so honestly, kind of immediately, Kurt just like, wasn't my type for whatever reason we bonded as friends. Like we were like buddies throughout the show, but there was never any like romantic connection. Mm -hmm. Um, And Steven was, like arguably exactly my type, like all American played football was like really athletic, very determined, um, like had, you could just tell he had a lot of drive behind him. Um, and so I was interested in him like immediately, but just like hesitantly. And then our first group date, this is like behind the scenes that nobody knows about. Um, our first group date, we went to, we were split into two groups. And so it was Steven and then like six girls, maybe, uh, or like eight girls, And we went to uh, just like a dive bar and like all wore flannel and like drank beer and did ski shots and danced. All wore cowboy boots. It was like very Southern. Uh, And they filmed in Georgia. And so then we're on, we're the, the dates winding down. So we go to the producers and we're like, we're not ready for this party to end yet. Can like, can Steven come back to the house with us and have a, like a pool party? And they were like, okay, if everybody takes one shot, then we'll let this happen. So we all take one more shot and we get in the, in the shuttle. And just kind of by chance, I end up sitting next to Steven. And so we're in the car ride back. And then he starts like rubbing my leg, but like secretively. So the other women in the bus don't know. And I'm like, that's weird, right? And I was like, oh, he's meaning to do that on purpose. And then we get up and we're getting out. And then it was Steven and I were the last two on the shuttle to get out. And he turned around and he was like very respectfully, but he was like, I cannot wait 
to talk to you more one-on-one. And so I'm like, he's interested in me. And so then I had this like running high ever since that day that I was like, this is going to be us at the end of it. And every action I did, every action he did made me believe that. And then, um, a few other weeks down the line, we were on our, one of our last one-on-one dates and we ended up going on a hot air balloon and it was so romantic and it was beautiful. And like, we just like had really nice moments. And so we were driving from that date, dropping him off at the house and then me at the hotel I was staying in at the time. Um, and so we're in the back of the car and like making out. <laughs> and then we kind of had this moment and we looked at each other and earlier in that date, which it did air on camera was me talking about how I've been ready to get into a relationship with the guy before I tell them that. And then they tell me they're not ready. Then I leave heartbroken. And so I told him this during dinner and I was like, and this is where I'm getting with you. And I'm starting to get scared. And he, we like talked about it at dinner, but then in the car later that night, we had this moment and you know, when you just like are with somebody and you feel like the electricity, mm-hmm. it was one of those moments. And then I was like, see Steven, like, this is why I'm scared. And he was like, Annie, you don't have to be scared. And so to me, I was like, damn, he is telling me that he's picking me like, great, I'm good. And so then fast forward literally two days from that date, maybe three, um, I get to the finale and he tells me that he had a stronger connection with somebody else in the house. And so I was completely taken off guard. I like had no idea where this came from. Um, I was really, really surprised But then when I got back to New York the next day, I was like, wait a minute, like, this is okay. I'll be fine. Wow. Okay. So it gets hot and heavy in the back of the car. Then a few days later, the finale that everyone saw where, you know, it was kind of that last moment where you said, ah, I'm sorry. And you walk out, right? That that thing that turned into a GIF everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, People on Twitter shouting you out (laughs) from you. All right. Okay. We're going this direction. Um, I mean, do you think that within this this filming that that you loved him? No, and I never used the word love. Um, I mean, in the time that we were at the show together, mm-hmm. we had two full one-on-one dates that were like five hours and then a half one-on-one date was which was around two and a half. And then group dates and like we had group like conversations, but all in all, we probably spent like less than 20 hours together. And so I didn't know him, but I knew I was intrigued by him. I knew like I could potentially fall for him. And Mm so I, that was the first time in the finale, which aired is the first time I told him like, I'm falling in love with you. So I was very careful to on my words to not say, I love you because I didn't love him. Mm -hmm. I was like falling and -hmm. I just needed him to like meet me there. I wasn't, my mind wouldn't have let me actually fall in love with him. Had I not known that he was falling with me. And so, no, I wasn't actually like actually in love with him, but imagine you're completely cut off from the outside world. And these are the last two men on earth and you're only interested in one over the other. Like those feelings developed really, really quickly. Yeah. I mean, absolutely. I I guess you, you seem to be okay with the premise of the show where many women are trying to go and, and see if they would, they would match with one man. But if the cameras were not there, producers were not there, and this is regular life, would you still be in the running for for someone that wasn't to do with the TV show like that? Absolutely not. Oh, my God. I'm very not territorial and not jealous, but I am of the type that if I'm investing in you mm-hmm. and if I know I'm interested in you, I want to see where a relationship could go, and you're not even giving me the time of day, like, okay, I'm out. I'll go find somebody that does care about me, that does love me, that does, you know, prioritize me in their life. Um, So it was a very specific mindset that I had to have while Mm -hmm. I was on the show that I wouldn't get jealous. And um, I actually think my experience in pageantry helped me so much on the show because I've been around large groups of women with the biggest personalities you've ever met literally my entire life. Mm -hmm. And so when I got into this house of loud women who were all stunning and had really big personalities, they had really great resumes all all in themselves. They were all really successful. Um, I was very mentally strong to not get in my head and to stay confident in who I was. But yeah, if I was in the real world, like this is not a dating show. No, no, no. I'm like a one at a time kind of gal. I was going to say, you re- you really do not, the amount of times that, that we've uh, we've communicated, you do not strike me as someone that would be in the in the running with four other women for one man no. out here in the regular world. Damn, now I'm a prize. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. So with, um, when was, uh, fill me into to calendar 
time like you get off the show so finale happens and you walk out when is that like are we in 2022 are we in 20 no this was yeah this was still 2021 and so film wrapped mid to late october i can't remember the exact mm-hmm. date but i got home before halloween okay. um and so then i wasn't allowed to like i signed an nda i wasn't allowed to even tell anybody what the show that I was on a show, let alone Mm -hmm. what the show was. Mm -hmm. And so my friends kind of put two and two together to figure out because I was really sad um, when I got back and they were like, something like happened, like it didn't go well, but then they all stayed pretty quiet. Mm -hmm. But I couldn't tell my coworkers other than my immediate bosses where I was. I was just on leave. And so a lot of people thought I was in like a treatment facility or something. And it was really sweet that they were caring for me. Um, But then the show was announced in December, like right before Christmas. Mm -hmm. So after those, what was that? Like eight weeks maybe of staying completely silent. Then finally I could be like, no, that's where I was. Like I was just on a show. Um, But I couldn't talk to Steven at all. Nor I didn't really want to either. Mm -hmm. Um, But we didn't have any contact at all throughout the rest of the show airing. Mm -hmm. Um, We had like, dms back and forth but we were also required to post on social media as the show was airing so it was very strange to be Mm. posting like pictures of me kissing this guy that like in my mind ended up breaking my heart and i had to be really positive about it but then in my mind i was also like okay i want america to be as shocked and disappointed as i was at the end so i really leaned into it and i was like i'm gonna give these people who are following and watching something to root for so then they can feel what I felt at the end. It was very selfish. And like, I'm okay with that. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, what, what's wrong with that? At the end of the day, if you were that blindsided, shouldn't they feel that you were that blindsided? Not yeah. this like sourpuss upset, you know, through the releasing of the film. Like it, it seemed like y'all had watch parties, right? Your friends yeah. all got together. Like a lot of people tagged you in stuff on social media, on Instagram, on Twitter, on what have you. And like you were your, your face was blowing up all over the place. I was like, Annie Jorgensen's on this show that is super hot right now. Yeah. So, I mean, that's got to kind of be going to be interesting. I mean, when so from the time that 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 aired, right, finale comes out and like is released. How long was it till you started dating again? So I was actually dating and I wasn't supposed to. I went on a few <laughs> dates. The show was airing, which proved to be an issue. So to really round out the timeline, filming ended in October, 2021. It was announced December of 2021. Mm -hmm. It aired the first week of January, 2022. And then the finale wrapped like mid March of 2022. Mm -hmm. So it was like around this time last year. Um, And so I started dating later in the show, but it was kind of silly. There was one guy that I had seen before the show and then we ended up not working out. And then he came back because probably because of the show. So we ended up going on a date before the finale aired and that he was talking to his cousin or like someone. And she was like, wait, isn't that the girl that's on the show? And he was like, yeah. And she was like, wait, I thought that she won. And so I was like, I kind of spilled the beans with this one person, my bad. Um, But I really started like actually dating probably like April of last year. And I really took it slow. I didn't go back on any of the dating apps because I had to delete that. I did get accepted to Raya. So I was like scrolling through Raya more for entertainment than anything. Um, And that's like a quote unquote celebrity dating Mm -hmm. app. So I would scroll through and see like the guy that plays Draco Malfoy and like random athletes that Mm -hmm. truly, I think I had like two dates come from that app that were both trash. (laughs) Um, (laughs) So I started dating, um, around like late spring through the summer, but I was like having so much fun, just like being focused on myself and focused on my career and focused on my goals that I was like, not willing to settle. I was like, I'm not going to find a boyfriend just because I feel like I need a partner. Mm -hmm. I felt at the time, like I felt so complete on my own and I was happy with my place in life. I was like, if I find someone who makes this better then I'm all for it, but I'm not like chasing, like reaching for any relationship I could get. Yeah. And and it looks like you did a not a soft launch. You did a little bit more of a hard launch recently, huh? Yeah. So I, as I said, I was dating all through summer, fall, and then my boss at the time texted me kind of out of the blue in December. So December of 2022, like relatively recently, mm-hmm. and she was like, "Hey, do you want to meet my fiance's friend Liam?" And I was like. Okay. At this point, oh, actually, hold on. I do have an, an element of the story that I am not mentioning. How could I forget? Mention it. 
So the show film like wrapped in uh, in May. Him and the girl that he did choose broke up in, I mean, sorry, in March. Him and the girl that he did end up choosing broke up in May, got back together, but he was talking to me through the summer and then really broke up at the end of the summer. And so then Steven came back into my life and was like, I made a mistake. I really want to see, like, I want a second chance. I want to see if we can make this work. And so it, my, in my mind, I was like, I always had these questions of like, why didn't he choose me? Mm-hmm. What happened? Where did I go wrong? Like what would have happened had he chosen me? Would it, would, have, would it have worked out? And so I had all these unanswered questions. And so when he did come back and I had the opportunity to potentially ask them, I was all about it. So my friend Carolyn from the show and I ended up like, we planned a girl's trip to Nashville. And so then we ended up running into him and Kurt that same weekend, Kurt was the other lead who Carolyn was interested in. And Carolyn was in the same place that I was in the show, that she was in the finale, but not chosen. And so it was the first time in a year that all of us had been in the same place again. And we all got to talk to each other about what had happened. And so it was really cathartic, I would say, of being able to actually just like honestly ask him questions. It was the first time we ever spoke to each other that was not filmed. Um, And so it was great. And we had such a fun time, so much fun to the point that he invited me a few weeks later to go to the farm for one of his Halloween parties. Um, And so we, Carolyn and I both went actually. So I went, he like flew me out there to see him and to spend the weekend with him. He introduced me to everybody in his very small hometown, but he introduced me to everybody in the hometown. And it very much felt like we were a couple. Well, I come to find out that all the while he's doing this, he's still talking to the girl that he initially chose on the show, like texting her being like, let's see a couple's therapist. I think we can work this out. And so that very quickly ended that. And so then after that had happened, I was like, I think I need a beat off of dating. Like, I'm really only going to focus on myself. I'm not going to go on any other dates through the end of the year. Well, in December, my boss texted me and she was like, do you want to meet my fiance's friend, Liam? And I was like, oh, okay. I was like, I can't say no to my boss. So we scheduled this date for a Monday and I was like, great. I'll go for one drink, meet him. I'm sure he, I'm sure he's fine. Like, I'm sure he's good, but like not going to be my guy. And then I'll go home and never think of it twice. So I go on this date and next thing you know, it's literally two o'clock in the morning on a Sunday or on a Monday. And I have work the next day. He has work the next day, but we just really clicked. And then we truly have been inseparable ever since. So yes, I'm officially off the market. I have a boyfriend, um, but he is really great. He is exactly what a boyfriend should be. He reminds me every day that I'm like prioritized. I'm his priority. He treats me like gold. And so like, I wouldn't, everything in my life led me to him. And I think I would take it 10 times over if he's my destination. Wow. That that's high praise, Annie Jorgensen. That's very high praise. I know it's crazy. I like, don't know, even know like uh, what's going on. (laughs) Yeah. And he's, uh, he's not half bad at taking Instagram pictures. So thank you. I'm whipping him into shape. Yeah. He's coming around. Yeah. He probably used to take blurry photos of his feet and now he is out here snapping Pixia on the sidewalk. So glad to see that you're training him correctly. Many yeah. men do not know how to use an iPhone 13 plus yes. at all. He's he's learning very quickly. If like let's say let's say you still were in a in a position where where you had met you said Liam. Mm-hmm. So you had met Liam in in December. Um, I mean, would you knowing everything that you know now, would you go back and go back through Joe Millionaire again? Yeah, absolutely. And it's not because that like led me to Liam. They were two like very independent situations and like dating was two very independent mm-hmm. situations. But the person I became during the show and then the person I became while the show was filming, I am so grateful for that. I am so much stronger. I've I thought I had thick skin before, but now I really have thick skin. Because if you can imagine a show based around money and the girls essentially like are they gold diggers or are they not there was a lot said about me on the internet most positive i would say maybe like half positive but there was a lot of like really cruel stuff i had to get off twitter i had to just like really i put on keywords that would remove them from social media posts and so i really did a good job of being confident in who i was and i was like the show is only showing a minuscule portion of what actually happened. I know what happened. I know everybody involved. 
that matters knows what happened. And I'm okay with that. The world will have their expectations. The world will have their opinions. And so because of that experience and like the mental tenacity that I had to have while filming, Mm -hmm. I would go back and do it 10 times over. Well, I think that that's a beautiful perspective. A lot of people, when, when stuff gets shown differently than it actually is, think that they need to go defend themselves to a bunch of strangers that wouldn't take a bullet for them anyways. You know? Yeah. I think that that, that says something about your character that like, Hey, look, I know what happened and, and I've got to live with all the choices that I made, but all of you cats that got the, uh, you know, the producers cut out here, don't really necessarily know exactly what happened. And, and that's fair. Yeah, they film 500 hours of content for one hour of an episode. And so if you can imagine most of what we did and what we said and what, yeah, all of that like was not in it. So yeah, and I mean, not even half of the story was told. No, not I mean, that that would be that would be literally two hours of filming, not even close. I mean, we're talking about I don't even know what that uh, what that percentage is, but uh, and and I want to respect your time. I know you got to get out of here in, in just a, a little, um, but did want to to talk about your new venture. So you were at, I mean, you're at Infinity, right? And is that the boss that you're talking about? Yes. Yeah, so okay. I was at Small Girls PR <clears throat> initially, left in 2022 fall. So like right when the show finished airing, I put in my two weeks and then I left to go to a different fashion PR firm called Infinity Creative Agency. Mm -hmm. And so I worked there for almost an entire year. And then Valentine's Day this year, I took it upon myself. I always say you have to bet on yourself. That's the best investment you can make. So I bet on myself, put in my two weeks, and now I'm full-time freelancing. So I'm freelancing kind of on two ends of the spectrum on one end of the spectrum, I'm still doing influencer marketing strategy. So I'm working with brands to develop their social campaigns, come up with messaging, come up with like target lists, like all the things Mm -hmm. that go into coming up with a marketing campaign. Mm -hmm. And then I also am working as an influencer and a content creator. And so I'm like working with brands on both ends of the spectrum there. And so I'm doing it full time. I've been doing it for a month now. And so I have an LLC set up. I'm basically a lawyer now. Um, If you have any (laughs) LLC questions, let me know. But I, yeah, like I said, I'm betting on myself, check in on me in a month to see if I'm still smiling, (laughs) but so far so good. Yeah. Was the transition hard? Um, no, (laughs) it was time. And it had been something that I've been thinking about for so long. And I found that that moment moment in my life was the right opportunity. Like I, I have money saved that if no income comes in that, like I would be able to survive for how much time, however much time. Mm -hmm. Um, and I was like, if I'm not going to do it now, then I don't think I ever will. And so I think it was all meant to be. I actually had told my mom, um, new year's around this time this year um that I was like I haven't done anything that scared me in a while like the show was scary moving to New York without a job was scary moving to Georgia without knowing anybody was scary Mm -hmm. I was like I've been just like doing pretty well for a while just like fine and I was like I need to do something that scares me and then when this opportunity came up timing wise I was like okay this is it this is we're doing it we're going yeah well I mean (laughs) I think that that's also solid it seems like every time in your life you're like all right I'm not jumping big enough time to uh to to send it off this diving board and see what happens <laughs> i would love to talk to a therapist and have them like <laughs> diagnose why that is i don't know if it's like a trauma response or if i'm actually being brave but it's it's been a fun journey so far i mean thus far even probably with tons of hang ups and tons of things that the world doesn't see you uh you managed to make it through you know managed to make it through and still have a realistic optimistic um yeah you know, perspective on it. So I think that that's a great thing. Um, as far as Annie J, right? LLC, where, where do you want to be 12 months from now? Uh, stable and steady. I, it's not that I necessarily want this company to grow. Like people have asked me throughout the past month, if I'm wanting to have employees and start my own Mm -hmm. agency. And that's not the goal. I really am enjoying freelancing and enjoying making my own schedule as a content creator, uh, especially in New York. There are so many events that happen. So now I have the flexibility of, you know, going to an event in like a random Wednesday morning, or maybe there's a luncheon that I can attend. So I really want to just have steady clients coming in on the brand uh, strategy side that I have a consistent income mm-hmm. where content creation is just my hobby. And it's something that I'm doing because I love it. And I want, and it's my creative outlet. It's like, that's where I 
thrive. It keeps me passionate. It keeps me excited. Um, so I just want to be steady and to be happy and to be able to make my own schedule. Yeah. Are you happy undertaking the, um, the opportunity with, with no promise of success? Yes, I am. And I think that's again, why I, I'm so grateful I took this leap of faith now Mm -hmm. is that because like I said, I have this income saved Mm -hmm. that if nothing comes in for the next however many months, like I'll, I'll be fine. Like Mm -hmm. I'm not going to get kicked out of my apartment. I'm going to be fed. Like I'll be, I have health insurance. I'll be okay. Um, But if it comes down to, you know, like however many weeks from now, and I haven't gotten any feedback, I haven't gotten any progress and I do have some progress already. um, But then I'll just get a full-time job and then I'll find a job that allows me to maybe not like go to a luncheon or go to a a morning event, but gives me the flexibility where I can, you know, travel on the weekends or still create content. Um, and then I'm I'll just be more selective about the jobs that I do that I am looking for, but yeah, I'm happy. Yeah. Best case, Annie J LLC. Absolutely. Uh, Best case, Annie J LLC goes to the moon. Um, and, and you become something massive solopreneur for now, potentially. I think that with your brain and with the uh, the level that you like to do things, I think you will have employees down the road if you stay on this path. Um, that's just me looking at what you've done in the past. I, I think that that'll be the case. Maybe not this year. <laughs> um, but then worst case scenario, you you continue to do what you're passionate about here and also yep. dive into another job and split some time there and and make it work either way, right? Yeah. Yeah. Oh my God. There's no shame. There's no harm in working full time. Like literally, I don't know. My, my dad is probably wanting me to go get a full-time job instead of doing what I'm doing now. Um, but yeah, it's, I'm proud that I'm taking this leap of faith in and that I'm doing it. And I'll be proud if I go back working full-time. Yeah. You're doing something that most people don't have the courage to do. And, and so I, I kind of want to end on this. I mean, you're, you're very intentional about, about uplifting other women that have come before, that come after, that are in similar scenarios, that haven't had the same opportunities. I mean, to any woman that's listening to this, that, that maybe feels a little bit of intimidation or feels like, oh, well, you know, Annie has, Annie has all these other titles and roles that she's had before. Like, I'm not like her. I mean, what advice would you give to someone that's listening to this that, that wants to make a leap and specifically is, is a woman in a industry that is not dominated by women. Yeah. Well, I think it's really important to remember that at the end of the day, people are just people. And what I have come to learn is that a lot of people that I've been around have an incredible resume or an incredible pedigree that they come from where they have awards or they've had roles, or maybe they've been in like movies, but once that's all said and done, everybody's proud of it. Right. But it's always about what are you doing next? And so just because you might not have something in your background doesn't mean you can't do something. And so it's always, as long as you believe in yourself. Um, and I, I work with girls on a one-on-one basis, just still on the confidence. Um, Mm -hmm. I got this programming and something I say constantly is you have to be the president of your own fan club. You have to be the one that believes in yourself, that has to be your best salesperson, because if you are not believing what it is that you're doing, I really believe in manifesting and speaking things into existence, that you have to see yourself in the position, in the role, in the life that you want to live. And if you can see it and you truly believe that you can get there, you'll figure out a way to get there. But if there's some element of your mind that's still setting back and be like, I, I could never do this work on your mindset first, because all of the action will follow. And if your mindset is there, your passion and your work will endure the trials, the tribulations that you will inevitably come across, you will fail. And I've already failed in the month that I've been freelancing, like you will fail, but that is just a step to success. Wonderfully put yet again, Annie, someone's been public speaking maybe a few times in her life. (laughs) Yeah, for sure. (laughs) <laughs> before we get out of here, where can the people find you? Um, where can they find what you're working on? How can they get tapped in, get on your newsletter, communicate with you or, um, or shout you out? If, if yeah, I think the easiest place to get in touch with me and to see what I'm doing is my Instagram. It's just my name at Annie Jorgensen, S E N at the end of it. If you are in the mood for some high quality and some unhinged content, follow me on TikTok. <laughs> it's at Annie Jorg. That's just J-O-R-G. Um, but those are the two best places. And then we'll go from there. Shoot me a okay. message. I'd love to connect. 
Awesome. Awesome. Well, I'm gonna stop the recording there, but I really appreciate you making the time for this. And uh, it's always, always a good time to connect. Wishing you the most success in this new venture and much happiness and much love from uh, from your partner and vice versa. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thanks for having me. This was so fun. Absolutely. Absolutely.